uh, quickly because we see one another frequently at budget committee meetings, and uh, just uh, three terrific members. Glad they're all here. Uh, I just want to uh, quickly respond to something my friend from Wisconsin said because I think he makes a really important point. Um, uh, this budget is important. It's largely important because it's a vehicle. You know, we all know that's no it's a resolution without force of law. Congress can do whatever it wants to. So, but there are a couple places where it really does matter. Uh, it really does matter when we finally get a negotiation uh, what the so-called 302A is, because that'll set the top line for discretionary. There's a number here, but it really doesn't matter because we have the Budget Control Act in place, so there'll be a negotiation. But my friend is exactly right about the unwillingness of anybody uh, or enough people on both sides of the aisle to get serious about entitlement reform and man or mandatory spending, whichever phrase that, that you predict. Uh, we're sitting here talking as if the taxes are going to unbalance the budget or as if what we do occasionally on the discretionary side is going to unbalance the budget or if, you know, what we, we do for our fellow citizens in dire situations and disaster relief unbalances the budget. None of those things unbalance the budget anywhere close to what goes on in mandatory spending. And that's a debate that has to really happen. Uh, now, I happen to think the tax... Uh, cut here, and, I, and there's room for people of goodwill on both sides of this issue to disagree, will ultimately generate economic growth, and that's a good thing, provide opportunity, generate uh, long-term additional revenue. And my friend Mr. Burns gave us several examples where that indeed has proven to be the case, uh, and it's even more significant uh, when they're permanent, or at least elements are permanent, so people can literally make investments long-term and and no. So I think I look on that as a positive contribution, and that, frankly, is the main reason why I'm willing to vote for this budget. I don't like the budget itself very much. I think our friends in the Senate, we keep sending really good people over there, but they all turn into senators. Uh, you know, I don't know how much more of this we can stand. Uh, we had a lot of people over there that have arrived in the last two or three cycles that used to vote for budgets like the kind that Mr. Grothman's talking about, uh, that, that literally had much more significant entitlement reform. And he's exactly right when he says $200 billion over 10 years out of what will be over $30 trillion worth of mandatory spending is nothing. It's a rounding error. So the fact that our friends in the Senate uh, couldn't muster up the courage to do that is concerning to me. Uh, so I just want to encourage my friend from Wisconsin to continue to raise the issue. He's raising the right issue. Um, I think we will be, uh, uh, the speaker made a commitment, as my friend knows, uh, in conference, largely due to my friend's comments, that we're going to be addressing that next year, that we get this thing done. That becomes item number one, is to, to start looking at the mandatory uh, area. So uh, I... Uh, uh, actually made this same point recently to the President of the United States. Didn't much like this budget. You know, I, th I thought it stinks. You know, really do. It's not nearly as good as the one that Ms. Black produced, and I know my friends disagree with that, but it's a serious budget. It balanced within 10 years. It had some mandatory savings in it, and I think it was a good faith effort to try and move us in the right direction. Uh, but these opportunities for tax reform don't come very often. Uh, and the last serious one around here was uh, a long, long time ago in 1986, predates anybody that's on uh, up here now, I think, in terms of their time in Congress, perhaps, but certainly mine. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I'm going to take this opportunity while it's coming because I think that's the best our friends on the other side of the rotunda uh, can do. But they're going to have to do a lot better, and the administration's going to have to join in that, too. Uh, and uh, you, you can't do serious... Uh, you know, mandatory spending reform without administration leadership. And I'll also say that my friends on the other side of the aisle uh, will need to participate in that, too. When, we, when you do mandatory spending reform, there in, uh, there's only one way to do it, and it's bipartisan. Uh, now, there's a lot of talk about third rails and the inability to do this stuff. The reality is Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill didn't exactly see the world the same way, but they managed to get it done. And the year after they got it done and extended the life of Social Security, uh, they, uh, Ronald Reagan won 49 states in re-election. Tip O'Neill stayed as Speaker of the House. 
So when you work together for the right things, you really can do it. And I will tell some of my friends on my side, if you really want to fix it, you're going to have to put additional revenue in it. I'm going to tell some of my friends on the other side, when we're all living a lot longer, it's not going to stay forever. It was 65 for my dad. It's 66 for me. It's 67 for my 35-year-old. Uh, all of us have been given plenty of time to adapt to that, 401Ks, IRAs. I applaud the president for defending those. Uh, so, uh, uh, but we're going to have to get, uh, and I would, I would commend my friends. I'm taking a little longer, but I'll, I'll quit with this because I don't really have a lot of questions here. Uh, uh, my friend Mr. Delaney and I actually went back and looked pretty thoroughly at what President Reagan and, and uh, Tip O'Neill and really Howard Baker did. And they set up a commission. It was called the Greenspan Commission. And they basically took about a year. We all know what the fixes here are, particularly on Social Security. It's a math problem. We know how long people live. We know how many of them there are. We know about how much money comes in every year. You just got to, if you don't want to throw out the program, and I do not, I want to save the program, restore it to fiscal uh, soundness. Uh, you know, it, it's literally a pretty quick negotiation. And you sit down and... Uh, Everybody puts a little something on the table, uh, and you can fix this thing. Medicare and Medicaid are much harder because uh, you know, we've really done something in the last generation. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, we used to increase lifespan just simply by cutting infant mortality. We didn't really add to the end of life. Most people died by around 70, uh, and uh, that's changed now. You get to 65 today, you got a 50% chance to get to 85. You've got a 25% a, a chance of getting to 93. Now that I'm 68, by the way, just for the record, I think these are very good things. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it's expensive. It's an expensive time of life, usually, because of the health challenges that are associated with it or, or the ravages of disease like Alzheimer's, where we step up as a country and look after people who are in those awful circumstances. So, um, Let's, you know, those are going to be tougher, but I, again, I think they're doable too. But we should start with Social Security where we can. And uh, I'll just end with this. Uh, while we're arguing taxes and we're arguing, I said, my friend here from Wisconsin has put his finger on the real problem, which is entitlement spending and the unwillingness to do anything about it, even reasonable things. You know, it's not unreasonable to raise the cap. You know, uh, so that more people pay. It's not unreasonable in a day of lengthening lifespan to tell people that are 30 or 40 years. I'm not talking about people that are close to retiring. They didn't do that, uh, you know, when uh, Reagan and Tipo. But they gave you plenty of time and, and mechanisms to adjust. Uh, and those kind of common sense things can save what's been the most important single program for lifting people out of poverty and keeping them out of poverty in their senior years. So... Uh, I want my friend to keep uh, sounding the warnings, uh, and uh, hopefully next year uh, we'll have more people that listen to him because this will be in the rearview mirror one way or the other, uh, and maybe we can get serious about uh, actually going after some of these concerns and correcting them. So with that, I know it went on a long time, but I feel very strongly about what my friend's doing. So I yield back, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank Chairman, you thank you very much. Uh,